Okay, why are you going to the house? I'm going to go to the house. Señor, dejo yo lo en la cara con tu punco, campo y malata. Señor, San Cate Jaicate con Cruz, San Chavico y la Palaicuta, Soma con Chanta Churabaico, Ulanapo, Salcantay y Apuascarán, malata que van a ir a Tampi, a Pucunapas, Manapa y que Estados Unidos y Achtamanta, Hato, Apu, Apuchasta, malata que ya están Hawaii y Achtape. Mamá Pili, Mamá Cocha, ya palian, uno Mamá Cuna, Mamá Cocha, Mamá Cuna, Samin Chayuay, Coque, ya palian, Paco Masicunata, Marque y Terce Pacunata, ya palito para Jalin, dos seis marcados, seis por Icuna, planta con una barbea, su trabajo, salos, ni que ya para causar ni que para Jampuy, Jampuy. Are you in Sweden or Norway now, Lolo? Norway? Yes, still in Norway. Yes. We have Norway, we have Greece, we have England today. Peru and Hawaii. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Do Thank you for participating. Uh, Papa. Wajapanaikuna, Ankaipeka Kashanku, Noruega Manta, Chaimanta, Grecia Manta, Kashanku, Inglaterra, Chaimanta, Hawaii, Chaimanta, Peru, China. Kunyunaska Kashaiku, Anke Internet Ukumpi, Computer of Song Gumpi, Niskaiki Hina Don Francisco. Ali, Ali, Mila Pala, Wajapanaskuna. Soma que Pachamaman, Sakuns Monaini, Pino Panches, que Internet to Humpe to Pachanches, Rimacuchanches, Pala, Sun Sumaca, Alinda Bajar Sun Slapa. So, with the love, with the love, and with the permission of Pachamama and the Apus, we are in the heart of the computer, in the heart of the internet meeting all together. Thank you very much. That's what Don Francisco says. Okay, Freddie, I made you co-host, and if um, okay, let's, Victor and Gloria. Okay, Francisco, Francisco, uh, Gloria, Juan Victor, Jallarizajo, ya. Nisbaca, la pantalla, voy a compartir la pantalla y comienzan ustedes a presentarnos vuestro trabajo, ya. Okay, so. Ya, yeah, okay. Our, our brothers from Eros are going to are going to speak to us about the agriculture agriculture in the in the Ero nation. Perfect. So the, there we go. Are you are you is it okay? Is it being shared? Everybody can yes. see that? Wonderful. Yes, wonderful. This is the agriculture in the Eros community. Okay. Agricultura in la comunidad de Eros. Okay. So Es todo vuestro, Gloria y Juan Víctor. Hermanos y hermanas, buenas tardes con todos. Y acá nosotros vamos a presentar sobre nuestra agricultura que realizamos en la comunidad de Peros. Y acá estamos... Vamos a desarrollar cada actividad que hacemos paso por paso, ¿no? So, my brothers and sisters, 
uh, we are going to teach you what is the agriculture activity in our community of Keros, hoping you are going to understand, and we are going to do pace by pace. Me dices, Juan Victor, cuando pase a la siguiente diapositiva. Siguiente. Okay, next. But Freddy, does everything start with this beautiful look between the man and the woman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are our young sacred couple. That's a very nice picture. That's beautiful. I think it starts with this love, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Comienza, ellos comentan que comienza con la primera diapositiva de nuestra pareja sagrada, joven. No nuestra pareja de amor, así dicen. Felicitaciones, Gloria, Juan Víctor. <laughs> Muchas gracias, muy amable. Acá vamos a apreciar lo que son las herramientas y más que todo acá utilizamos chaquitaglia, pico y alacho. El chaquitaglia es lo más principal ¿no? que utilizamos siempre en, en toda la agricultura, chaquitaglia. Después pues, viene pico y alacho. Y acá mmm, se puede apreciar lo que es chaquitaglia. Ahí se ve dos, ¿no? dos chaquitajes y es, son, están hechos de madera y hay de chachacoma y que uña así. Y también oh, antiguamente utilizaban lo que es en aliacho o en lampa, lo que es palo, que, un palo que da vuelta, ¿no? eso era aliacho y ahora ya complementamos con metal. Uh -huh. Okay, so there we go. We can see, you know, these basic tools that the Ero people uses for their agriculture activity. You have to understand that everything is done in a manual way because the topography of Eros is so accident. Uh, I mean, it's irregular, okay? There is no flats there. They don't know what's flat or you go up or you go down, all right? The stairways up or down. So it's impossible for them to use a machine as we can use in most of our countries. So we see here these manual tools that they use, starting with the main one. The most important one, it is this, the large one, which is in the middle, which name is Chaki Takria. Chaki means food. Takria is our food working, okay? Because this is the main tool that they use for plowing the, 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 the farming lands, okay? So this is a tool in which the, the weight of a person, you know, will help them to put the iron spade down in the soil and then flip that, okay? Same as the tractors makes, the chakitaklia. You have to have a great skills to use this, a great skills. Okay, so it's mainly when you go to the farm, when some citizen, people from the city goes, you know, they give to the city man to use it, okay, just to try. And you have to have any skills for this and you have to be actually be born working with it. You know, well, in the, in the past times, they used to use only made out of wood. They didn't have these iron spades. Okay, this is recently used, okay? It's not, that's from the say 20th century. At the 19th century, they used to use only made out in wood, okay? And that was made out of chachacoma and keunia, which are the native species of trees that we have here that actually are a harder than other kind of trees, you know, has been introduced in South America, okay? And then we have to the left side, we have with the brand Trooper, okay? That is an aliachu. Aliachu mainly they use for harvesting. They harvest with it, okay? So they have to be very careful. In the previous times, like in the 19th century, the Kero people used to use only a curved wood, you know, that they would use as a pick and they would just harvest with it. Nowadays, of course, you know, they, Iron has been introduced that now they use the, the additional iron in it. As complementary one, they have the shovel and many other tools that you have around, you know, 
for them to work, you know, in the utilitarian way and agriculture, I would say, agriculture and also to build their houses, you know, mainly most of these tools they have is multifunctional. Okay. Freddie, Gracias. They don't, the question. Yeah. They don't, they don't use the chonta from the jungle. Isn't that a very, very hard wood? Eh, Juan Víctor, ¿utilizan chonta para algo? ¿La madera chonta para algo? Para hacer agricultura, no. Yeah. No utilizamos chonta. ¿Para qué utilizan la chonta? Mm. Utilizaban para realizar el baile, para ir al señor de Coyote, ahí bailan lo que es el chuncho, en ahí es lo que utilizan, lo que es el chonto. Yeah, chonta seems to be, chonta seems to be a ritualistic word. Ceremonial. Okay, ceremonial. So they, they use for dancing, well, they have this uh, typical dance from Eros, which is the Guairi chuncho, all right? or jungle person, you know, and uh, one of the uh, main uh, part of their outfit was the chonta, say, staff. They used mm -hmm. to dance with that, yeah. Y también Muy utilizan nice. chonta para protección de energías o mala vibra. Es en, en digamos, en un... En, Pujuñawi, ¿no? Es, digamos, nos podría ver como sarna, entonces ahí lo ponemos, lo metemos, ¿no? Para que ya no vuelva a agarrarnos. Mm -hmm. So it's very important what, uh, what Juan Víctor says. It is mainly ritualistic because the chonta wood works as a protection for a heavy energies, mainly for <clears throat> the different kind of wires. Okay? So they say, like, if you think that you got affected by a kind of wire and possibly, you know, that shows up through kind of spots in your skin or, you know, or perhaps a kind of infection of those little pots, okay? Or spots, then they, when they identify that that is pukyu or wire, then they cure it with chonta. Mm. So it's ah. not, a, it's mainly ritualistic wood, it's not. Uh, used for uh, farming activities. Okay. okay, please go go ahead. Sorry okay. For the uh, continuamos, Juan Víctor. Y siguiente, por favor. Siguiente diapositiva. Okay. Ay, qué bonito. Al poquitas. Llamitas. Ya kunan karikusunche es wanoi, wanoi me es un sapan kachakrapi roaikos sohta guatamanta, sapan lugar manta. Nosotros realizamos en cada seis años un, como un círculo, ¿da, ¿no? Digamos, en este lugar hemos sembrado este año, entonces de acá de seis años. Al mismo lugar vamos a regresar, entonces ahí es donde vamos a hacer el guano. Es donde vamos a reunir todas las, todos nuestros animales que tenemos, oveja, llama, alpaca. Es, vamos a reunir, entonces ahí vamos a, um, ahí como abonar, ¿no? Solo fertilizar la tierra. Y, y vamos a también realizar en tres partes. En parte baja, lo que es eh, está a no, 2.400 a 2.800, ¿no? Parte baja. Entonces, en el medio va a estar lo que es el de 2.800 a 3.200. Y parte arriba va a ser lo que es 3.800 a 4.400. En, en, en este trayecto realizamos lo que es agricultura. Acá. Okay, 
So this is this very nice activity that actually, this is one of the unique places where you can see this, the Cairo people, the Cairo community, which is the Wanui. Okay, Wanui, Wanui, Wano, Wano comes from a fertilizer. Wanui is the, the action of fertilizing. But in this case, they use the, uh, the waste of the, your animals as a main fertilizers, like say, the alpacas. But how they do it, okay? How they do it? Their activity goes, okay, from 2,400 in the low part to 2,800, in the middle part, 2,800 to 3,200, and in the highlands is from 3,200 to 4,400. Okay, so the activity that the Inca people, their ancestors taught them, it is the Muyu system. What is the Muyu system? It is to not farm in the same place, you know, the following year. They have to let the soil get fertile and rich, you know, once they do the harvest. So the month when they do that is in March, but every March, every six years, listen, if they farmed, you know, in the, in the area where the alpacas are, okay, well, for the following six years, they have to choose another place, okay? So, well, while that area is resting, they take to the alpacas, though the alpacas will drop their waste there. So they are fertilizing and for the following six years. And then the alpacas is going to be taken to the place where they recently had the harvest, okay, for other six years. And then they will just drop their waste there. So every single thing is made in a natural way. The Muyu system, is well acknowledged by uh, agriculture scientists nowadays as the most healthy system, you know, to have quality crops and in a natural way. This is why most of the Andean communities, you know, have a very, very healthy food because they don't use chemicals in it. This is what Juan Victor is explaining to us. Juan, it is the activity of fertilizing the soil and the way how they rotate the land where they are going to farm their potatoes as well. Done every six years and mainly they do in March. Gracias, so each, Juan Victor. So each year they rotate, Freddie. Every, exactly. every six years. Every, every Wow. Yeah. Remember that Cairo Nation is big. Okay, it's very big. So they have enough places, you know, to rotate every six years. And pretty much this is this is what you you know what it's known not only there in the most of these Andean communities who preserves the technique of farming of the Inca people you will see that they are organized within the community you know they say this is the area where this year we are going to plant and then the animals will go to that particular area for the following year, you will see the animals in another particular area and the farm in another particular one. So they organize themselves like that. <clears throat> this is amazing. This is the wonderful. Wanui means for, to fertilize. It's a verb. Exactly. Wanui, yeah. <coughs> Continuamos, Juan Victor. Y si Gloria quiere hablar, también Gloria, por favor. Juan Víctor. Can you see on Can you see on your screen then? No. 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 They disappeared. They're probably going to come back in. Yeah, possibly they will because because as they said, it's foggy, it's rainy, it's cold. Mm -hmm. Possibly they your satellite, you know, is it's uh, <clears throat> finding trouble if to it, get a signal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing though. Six years crop rotation. That's really giving the land a lot of time. And he said um, alpacas, llamas, sheep, and they have vicuñas also, Freddy? Vicuñas, vicuñas are wild, okay? They are not domesticated. 
So they don't, they are not part of the one way because to get the two realize the activity of one way, you have to only work with the domesticated animals, not with the wild ones. No vicuña, no guanaco in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it it is amazing. You know, this is this is how the Andean communities in the Inca time, you know, got enough and quality food for their population. And we are very glad the fact that these communities are still preserving that system, you know. And I don't think it's going to last for, you know, in the future for more years, you know, because we have we are having this hunger of people as we have the demographic explosion you know in in which most of the communities wants to have the harvest in the same place for more years you know not as the inca people did mm -hmm. and have you tried planting with the chakitakia Ready? Can you do it? I worked. I worked with it. I was expert. My granddad did a chakitaklia for my size. My granddad was so, so curious. And he, you know, he said, oh, I will make a chakitaklia for his size because remember that I came out from my community when I was 14, more or less 13, 14, you know, and I was a tiny one. Well, even thought now I'm tiny, you know, I'm, I'm only a small man but I was even tinier. So I had my special chakitaklia for me to work. Very, very nice. And yeah, I got the skills. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, Elizabeth, I can, I can explain as far I know about uh, these items, uh, this subject, sorry, until they come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's quite similar, you know, as, our experience in our community too. So your community of Rosas Pata yeah. is go up to Ollantaytambo and take a left or take a right and walk through well, the mountain for four days. Uh, walking, <laughs> towards, walking towards Machu Picchu, then you take the right side up to the uh, Patacancha and Wilok Valley. You reach up to the top, a pass, and then you go down and then you go a little up again, and then you arrive to the Lares Valley, which is another very fertile valley like the Sacred Valley. So my community is around 3,200 to 2,800. So my community, is it is exactly as the scenery in these pictures are, not 3,200 to 4,400. The Kero people lives up to that altitude, so my community is lower. So the activities of the Ero people with my community is 3,000 to 3,200 to 2,800. Same as happens here, you know, it's a photo of Don Francisco there. Possibly this is below, okay, below the, mm. uh, the community where they have the año and other varieties of potatoes and also a uh, somais, you know. So the activity here, which is the Rama Haitai, you know, that is the, the word, the Rama Haitai. Uh, Rama, it is, uh, say, the bushes, little bushes. Haitai, it is the activity that you do by the usage of the Chaki Taklia. Okay, so it's the time when you use more the Chaki Taklia because this is the strongest tool they have for taking the little bushes from their root, as you can see happened in this land, you know. They just flipped most of these little bushes, you know, and then they will just leave it there, you know, when they flip, and then they are going, they are going to go into the process of uh, putrefaction, I would say. They, they will start rotting, okay? This is made in the month of April as the uh, diapositive, as the presentation says. Why in April? Because it is, it is the transitional time 
in between the wet season and the dry season. So the rain stopped and we are expecting the, the dry season in May, June, July. So this is the time when the soil is still humid, but it's not muddy, it's only humid. And it's easier, you know, for the chakitaklia, for the powerful tool to go deep in the soil and then flip to the bushes, you know, opposite down, the roots is going to see to the sky. Now, as is the entrance of the dry season, then these little bushes that were flipped off won't have the chance to regrow because there is no rain. So this is going to just convert into a dirt in the future, okay? And then they are going to use in September for Maguay, which is in the Quechua language means the first harvest. They are going to put the potato seed or the corn seed or whatever other crop seed there for having the first harvest, which happens early in, in February and March for the Quechua people and other communities who are located in 3,000 uh, 200 to 2,800 more or less. Right, so that is the Rama height. I, that is the plowing work, getting ready the land for the uh, planting seeds in the future. Do we have so, them? We no, they're not back, but um, we can. I was just translating the because meters I don't understand so much. So I was translating to feet. So lower keros. You can like, you can just uh, multiply by three. It's three point two. So you, you, ninety two hundred feet is the lower keros. And then yeah, and then middle keros is, is pretty much where your community is, right? Exactly, Freddie, sort of exactly. their middle. Yeah. Which is yeah. 9,200 to 10,500 feet exactly. more or less. And then the upper is incredible. It's, it's wow, 12,500 to 14,000. Exactly, yeah. Wow, that's exactly. up there. That's really yeah. up there. Actually, at that, at that altitude, there is there is no as much agriculture. Okay, at that altitude, they have more uh, cattle raising. Well, I would say cattle raising, but alpaca raising. You know, wow. yeah, it's the more alpacas, because that is the alpacas like that altitude. They don't mind. They don't really. You know, the alpacas and the llamas. You know, mm. they are really from that altitude because they are food. It's out of a straw, okay? And then the, the humid areas, they have very nice sprouts of, of, of a straw. And I would tell you, the, the mo I mean, the economy, the economy, you know, how they could see money, I would say nowadays is through the alpacas and llamas. And agriculture is self, uh, so, so self sustaining activity because it's only for them to eat, right? Yeah, so you guys go ahead and unmute. Um, you, you're there's some interesting things in the chat here. Kaya says she read that the soil is really healthy from being cultivated by humans, and also some is in the jungle. Very fertile soil, yes, I think so. Wow. Kona, you have a question. You can go ahead. So the question is, um, the community, each community of uh, Cairo Nation uh, works on pieces of land that belong to the specific community or anywhere they can choose to work. Uh, I mean, no. is there a piece of land that uh, belongs to the Hatun Kero, another piece of land that belongs to the Totorani, or, or they can work anywhere they like? Uh, no, they, they have jurisdiction. 
they have their uh, okay. jurisdiction. Mainly it is, they are separated by rivers. Okay. Ooh. So yeah, exactly, exactly. So as like Colpacucho, they have their border with Cochamoco. Okay. And they know where the borders are. Okay. And then they have to just respect their jurisdiction and the community of Colpacucho, they, you know, they don't own the land as a, you know, as a, as a person. The, the community owns the whole land of them and the president and, you know, the leaders will tell them where to farm, you know, for this year and where the animals will go and then they will swap where they will farm and where the animals will go. So they have a very strict organization, which is even more stronger than the central government instructions. That's very yeah. interesting. And it reminds me of the law, a similar law, the, the Indians of the Northern America, they used to have restrictions like that. Exactly. It's, it's very in, powerful. In Hawaii. It's very, it's the same as in Hawaii. You have a, pie slice of land from the mountain to the ocean. And it's called an Akupua'a system, and it falls along the watershed, same as what you're saying in Keros. So in Keros, we have the watersheds separate the land areas. So it's very easy to see the border, right? Um, so in Keros, we have six communities, the entire thing is called Hatun Keros, right? So you have an individual president of each community, Kolpakuchu, Kochamoko, and Kochamoko borders Charcapata or Kochamoko? No, Chal or Chalima Chimpana. Chalima Chimpana. And Chalima Chalma is bordered Chalma. with, Border. with uh, Choa Choa. Choa Choa. Yeah. And, and Kolpakuchu, Kolpakuchu, is border with with Charcapato. Ah, and yeah, uh, Colpacucho has to the right side to Charcapata, to the left side to Cochamoco. Cochamoco, Charcapata, and then all of and then Queros Totorani is. Do you know where, Freddy? Queros Totorani. It is bordered with Hatun Queros. And it's okay. six communities, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, but the entire thing, so there's a president of each individual community that serves for exactly. one year. And then there's the president of the entire Kero nation, which is called Hatun Kero. Yes. And I think he serves for one year. No, each 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 president serves for two years. Two years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I also have a question, if I might. Go ahead, uh, please, Sophia. Uh, so every everybody in the community harvests and uh, plows together for the whole community, right? Not each family for their own. Everybody contributes to the community, and then everything is shared by the president. There is distribution. It's a, it, it's a collective sort of farming, or it's household or family farms for the own. What you work is for your family, okay? Mm -hmm. So depending how much you farm, it's for your benefit. So okay. the local authorities will assign you the place where you will harvest for your family. Okay. So you harvest what you what you work so if you don't want to work simply you don't harvest for yourself okay? okay so exactly happens like that but they have the communal lands there mm -hmm. is an assigned a special place where all the community works for benefit of the community out of this harvest will be to feed to the elder people to the widows or to the orphans who are living in the community. So this is a great economical system based by the agriculture 
you know, that they still practice yeah. from the ancient times. So yeah, that's it's beautiful. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And they also and have a herds of alpacas that are individual and then the communal herd. Yeah. Exactly. The ones that are this for everyone and ones that are for the families. Yeah, and exactly. All families, yeah. all families contribute to tending the land that is communal, right? Exactly. So every family will contribute their own share for the benefit of the whole community. Exactly. Yeah. This is beautiful. the most beautiful. This is the most beautiful activity we, we would see like only in the communal lands is when you are going to see gathering to the whole community working and performing the, your chants, performing the, your ceremonies, doing a high warikui for the, your economy, for the, your harvest. This is the way how all these rituals have survived to the times, you know, to these, all these centuries. Yeah, and this is the time when they also make festivities, when they harvest and they wear their ritualistic or the, perhaps their festival outfits. Yeah, this is when they do the communal work. And it's a beautiful activity to gather around because it's sustenance. So to combine the ritualistic aspect of your communal living with the communal harvesting and everything, it's, it's a beautiful way of thinking, not only a practice, it's a way to organize a community around a common goal and for the common good, which is fantastic. I think it's, it's very, very evolved in my opinion. The other, the other aspect of it is the fact that you know, only the elderly people knows how is to interrelate amongst them. This is the time when they gather all together. This is what they took, you know, generation through generation, you know, how to work together and how interrelate with all of them. You know, this is the question that someone wasn't understanding when I was speaking in Chinchero, where they use machines to work their lands and suddenly, the elderly people don't like it. They say like, no, we want to work as a communal way, as the way how we were taught. And they are children. They say, dad, but you know, you are working this land in one week. I will put a tractor and I will just work it in one day. And the elder people says, my son, you really, you are not really understanding us. It's not the fact of doing faster. It is the fact of interrelating and sharing with your neighbors, speaking to them, making the rituals. What am I doing working alone and she in a machine working? So it's a different way of seeing agriculture, you know? So this is something that, you know, people of the city or who are not farmers, we don't understand. And this is still what the Kero people have. And this is the soul of agriculture made in the communal way has a particular communal bubble. They want to fit it, okay? They want, they don't want to lose it, right? And it's the same way, the same point of view with the weaving that you, it's a holistic operation and it's communal. And with, so it's the raising of the alpaca and the, the taking care of and the, the ceremonial um, celebration of the alpaca and then the shearing of the wool and then the weaving of the drop and the calling to the living being of the drop spindle and the calling to the living being of the patterns that you weave, right? So everything is alive, just like all the plants have to be celebrated and spoken to and invoked and then you have a real sacred food and i so remember when i came back from peru and everything tasted like plastic to me i was tasting the food the fanciest most organic special food in the u.s it tasted like Bleh. this has no taste this has no mana has no life force compared to the food that i was eating in peru which was like oh, food of the gods. <laughs> so that was my very visceral experience of that. Food 
created in this kind of way that we're talking about. It's, it's, everything is respected. Everything is alive and you are interrelating with in the sacred reciprocity with it all. So yeah. amazing. Because it's your body, your strength, your soul, your sweat that goes into it. And it's an investment and it's a dialogue with the earth. And yes. this is, it's so, it's profound. I, I love, Sophia, I love the idea, how you are building that idea, okay? It is the interrelation of you and nature, yeah. okay? So imagine, it's not, you know, when you see to these people working in a communal way, they do chanting, they chant their sacred songs. They offer all their love to the seeds, to the land, to the mountains, to the water, to all those are a part of this realization of agriculture. You know, this is something that you see, but only in the remote communities like the Ero people, you know? And for the time of the harvest, they receive what they offered in the planting seed time. This is when they thanks give to Pachamama, Mother Earth, today your mother, okay? Today your Apus, who creates the streams and creates water as a fertilizing sperm for Mother Earth, you know? So it's so beautiful. It's amazing. It's incredible the way how they interrelate with nature. It is why, you know, these people feels and thinks that this kind of communal events needs to survive because this is the true essence of interrelating with Mother Nature. It also it reminds me of the weaving that Elizabeth said as well. I mean, <clears throat> it's a practice of combining and weaving the energies together, whether it's cloth or whether it's uh, the planting and bringing all the elements together for the seed to grow and then grow again. And the people eat the the product of the seeds and it goes back to this energy again it's like everything is like interweaving every day all the time 24 7 everywhere and it's, it's life and it's a beautiful way to celebrate yes yeah this is also to nowadays you know why peru i don't know if you know but i'm telling you now if you don't know peru is one of the countries whose are emphasizing the organic agriculture because our irregular territory, you know, our topography is not as, is not allowing to us to do extensive, not even uh, intensive agriculture. Like, listen, you know, only the 3% of our territory in Peru, it is farming, wow. but 30% of our population are farmers. If you compare with the US, is 30% of their territory, it is farming, but only 3% of the population is farmer. So you can see how intensive and extensive these people work. But in Peru, it's impossible because we have the Andean mountain, it's so ragged. But we found that this technique that we inherited from the ancestors in which, you know, has been recognized the seven ecological layers 70% of the climates of the world are in the Interandian valleys. Out of this, the Inca people took advantage and create and domesticate these massive amounts of crops and varieties of potatoes and corn and many others. This is, and the flavor that all this has because the organic way of farming. And this is creating, you know, this new, say, uh, new power in Peru, which is the cuisine. Nowadays, yeah. the Peruvian food is being so famous. My dear brothers and sisters, this is not because we have the best chefs or we have the best universities that form chefs. I respect to the chefs highly and the institutes that we have, but the most important reason why Peru is leading on this in South America is because we have a lot of material, a lot of organic crops 
that opens the creativity of the chefs, you know? And it's all flavorous. It's so, it's, you know, and carrot, it smells deep to carrot. You can just smell it from a very, very far distance and you say, that's carrot, you know? Or, I mean, many, whatever other crop. It is something that we inherited from our ancestors. And now the Peruvian government, it is emphasizing the organic agriculture. Peru is the only country in South America whose regulation, agricultural regulation, said no to Monsanto, to uh, GMO, GMO or genetically modified crops, because it's useless in our territory. You know, it's more organic. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Go, Freddie. We're doing the same thing here. And here we have the protection of our, the Hawaiians have used the American laws, which don't, you know, which a lot of people say this is not really America anyway. This is not United States. But we use the United States law, which says you have the freedom of religious practice. And the Hawaiian religion says the taro plant is my ancestor. You cannot genetically modify my ancestor. That is illegal. You can't genetically modify my relatives. And they won in the court against Monsanto with this argument because it's in their religious doctrines that they are descended from the taro plant, right? The Hawaiians. <laughs> so it works to protect the, the plants, but sadly still Monsanto got in here with other crops. But um, so Freddie, I don't know if they're gonna be able to come back. They must have a lot of puyu and a lot of- yes. But you know, we have, Elizabeth, we have a very nice presentation that they prepared for us. I have a still, you know, I have a still uh, like ten other pictures to show you, but I would really like them to uh, present that to us. But let's leave this for the following because, you know, we had a very nice topic of conversation now, I think was very productive and yeah, this is going to be a kind of like holding more wisdom for the following week. And hopefully we are going to have to Juan Victor and Gloria who nicely explains all this work that they did, you know? So I think we have a lot of other weeks to speak about the agriculture of the Kero people. And yeah, so I would like them to explain, so. That's nice, Freddie. Um, and, uh... Last week, they explained to us about the three agricultural zones and all of these beautiful kinds of potatoes. You know, I used to feel sorry for the Kero thinking, oh, they only have potatoes to eat until I saw all the beautiful kinds of potatoes they have to eat. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it's amazing. They have the tiny little sweet ones and the big fat starchy ones and the purple and the red and the black and the yellow. Amazing variety. The, the, the different kind of beans, like the faba beans, for example, like the quinoas, all kind of quinoas they have. Oh. Listen, my beautiful family, you know, all those who are present in these Sunday Sami services, I will tell you something. You know, the Inca people were so focused. They, Aero people ancestors were very and highly focused in the nutrition facts that each food or each seed a tubercle or bean has. More or less, they were not focused in the flavor of those because most of the superfood of the Inca people might not be really flavorous and very, very tasty, but are so high in carbohydrates and proteins and vitamins. So the Inca people were so wise, you know, in domesticating the very, very potent kind of food, you know, thinking about, you know, 
in the in the importance of feeding well to their population. It is why if we just, okay, if we just consider these few seeds and a few tubercles and beans that the Kero people eat, it's more than enough to build their body, mind, and soul, rather than having thousands of other flavorous things that we have in Cusco, in Lima, or in Europe, or in the States, you know, that it's mainly tasty rather than nutritious, you know? So nowadays people is more focused in those things, you know? Like nowadays kids grows up with, daddy, can we take us please to McDonald's? It's long time ago that you don't take us, okay? Well, basically in Cusco, it's a treat. It's not something that you can give to them, all right? But we see that it's, it's junky food. You know, it's not worth it. We better have like quinoa porridge, okay? Instead of some other thing, which is so nutritious for them. So this is the reduced amount of food that the Kero people had or have is good enough to feed their body, soul, and mind. They don't need more, okay? Yeah. As far as so I saw. That's so beautiful, Freddie. And here's something even more shocking. Um, my husband, Barney, worked in the grocery business for 20 years. And they have a space. It's not even about the taste. It's about how it looks and the size. And so they have an exact amount marked out in the grocery store where the oranges are going to fit where the tomatoes are going to fit. So all the tomatoes have to be this size and everything else is thrown away and only looks good. The taste, the nutritional value, nothing. They pick it green, they gas it or paint it with a color so that it's the right color and the right look and the taste and the flavor and the nutrition they don't care nothing. That is the agriculture in the U.S. now. It's very it's sad. Also, how they they build the supermarkets? If you see that the, the fresh produce produce is at the entrance, so it gives yes. you a subliminal message that everything you find inside is fresh as well. Or they will uh, put out smells around the midday, so you feel that. it's all about perception, unfortunately. But it's because we consume everything so quickly, we don't even stop to think. You go there, you have your list, you are hurried, you have a million other things to do. You just want to rush in and rush out and get everything. And it's, it's so sad. <laughs> because in Greece as well, I mean, I have tasted tomatoes with taste and I know what it feels like and what it tastes like. And I know I cannot find it anymore. I remember the peaches, you know, in the summer. My goodness, you can smell them, your mother. You can smell them a mile away. Like you were saying, Freddie, about the carrots. And... You cannot find these things anymore. And it's such a sad thing. It's, it's, it's very... the downfall. It's the downfall of humanity because when we destroy yeah. our food, we destroy our health. It's so not, and I like what Freddie said about the mind, body, and soul. I mean, when you feed yourself, you don't feed your body only. You feed every, all these three aspects. And this is something that we completely neglect. Even myself, I will sit in front of the of my computer and I will eat my food watching Netflix. Perfect. Not even thinking of what I am eating, you know. And it's a it's a spiritual process. It should not be done this way. Yeah. But I think, think I yeah. think we do, we do not believe that we feed our uh, soul and our spirit uh, with food. We think. We can feed our soul and spirit only with books, mm -hmm. only with uh, internet and work. And uh, we cannot relate food with feeding our souls. Mm -hmm. I think this is what is wrong with this. Yes. It's a very nice way of seeing food. So. This is what I take today. Thank you very much. <laughs> it has been a great, great, great lesson. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's take a minute to send some Sami.
to our beautiful Greek forest, Mount Yerania. Let's just take a moment. We can do our little wafarikui if we want. Mount Yerania. Ask uh, our beautiful Sami to go to the mountain, to all of the animals, to the trees, to the Sachamama. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Ramak Asui. We have Ramak to wait. Asui. We have to wait till next week to find out what that is. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, it would be very nice to to listen, you know, from a one who practices that, who's our Victor, Juan Victor, and uh, Gloria, and of course his father, or their father, Don Francisco, one of our powerful, potential Alto Misayoc, uh -huh. as far as I feel. <laughs> it's a great one. Yeah. So, Elizabeth. Okay. Until next week. Until Hello. next week. <coughs> Goodbye, everyone. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Great seeing you again. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye